My name is Gabby Marabito, and I'm the Community Development Coordinator at Zeitgeist. Thank you for joining us today um, uh, at this conversation about becoming a people-friendly driver. And thank you to CJ um, of Bike MN and Get Fit Itasca for hosting this event. Um, this event is part of Zeitgeist Annual Bus Bike Walk Month, so I just want to say a quick thank you to all of our sponsors, um, HR Go, likewise, MPECU, CF Design, Essentia, St. Luke's, the DTA, Maurice's, Cirrus Aircraft, the Jamar Company, um, and SHIP Helping Northland in St. Louis County, who have all helped to make this event possible. We also do start all of our events with the acknowledgement that Zeitgeist and the Twin Ports are built on land that was originally Anishinaabe King and home to the Anishinaabe and the Dakota people, the original stewards of this territory. This land was ceded by the Anishinaabe in the 1842 and 1854 treaties, and historically and today it holds great significance for Indigenous people. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations who reside alongside us. This acknowledgement sets us up for today's presentation and how we can continue to create a safe, sustainable, and accessible community through transportation initiatives, such as becoming a people-friendly driver. I'd encourage you to check out the full list of upcoming bus bike walk activities on our webpage. And also a big thank you to all of our committee members, um, volunteers, and hosts who have helped to make these events possible. Um, so feel free to use the chat um, at any time during the presentation, and I'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, and now I turn it over to you, CJ. Thanks so much. I'm just going to launch my uh, slideshow here and All right. any second. There it is. Are you all able to see the, the slideshow on the screen? Perfect. That's um, great. So, well, thank you very much for having me. My name is CJ Lender. I'm the education manager for the Bike Alliance of Minnesota. Um, we work statewide to make biking easy, safe, and convenient for everybody. Uh, my role as the education manager is to make sure all Minnesotans have the information that they need to make walking and biking and rolling um, as easy, safe, and convenient as possible. And the People Friendly Driver is one of our education programs. Um, this one's specifically aimed at giving information to people when they're driving motor vehicles so that when they're sharing our transportation systems, um, they can act in a way that ensures that everybody using that, um, the roadways, has uh, an easy, safe, convenient trip. So thanks all for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for recording the call as well so that we can share this after the fact with folks who were not able to participate tonight. Um, I am happy to take questions during the call. Uh, I may or may not see them in the chat. So if I am, am acting like I'm ignoring you, um, please assume that I just haven't seen your question yet and uh, feel free to jump in um, or, um, or grab my attention however you can here. So with that, I'll advance to the next slide. Um, folks on the call, and I can see some people have a video on. That's great if you're able to join us that way. Um, if not, you'll just have to, um, you can actually use the functions on Zoom as well to participate and raise your hand. So even if you're not on video, um, raise your hand for the following prompts if, you, uh, if they resonate with you. Oops. Raise your hand if you ride a bus or a train. See a couple hands. Um, I, I think I did two at once. How about if you ride a bike? And some more hands. Um, anybody on our call drive a motor vehicle, a car or a truck? Many people. Um, how about anybody on our call who walks? Maybe when you get out of your motor vehicle or finished with your, um, your trip. So, and the, the idea here is just a reminder that we are all people. We're all people just trying to navigate, trying to get places, um, and we should all be able to do so uh, safely um, and without risk as, as much as possible. So that's kind of our, our main point tonight here. Um, our streets really do belong to everybody. They're a shared public resource. Uh, in fact, in Minnesota, they are our single largest shared public resource. Um, everybody has a right to use these spaces, but also a responsibility to do so safely to themselves and others. So that's what we are going to talk about a little bit tonight. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of background information about myself and our organization, um, some of the ways we do this. Most of our time tonight is going to be spent on safe driving practices, so ways in which um, we as uh, operators of motor vehicles can be as safe as possible for ourselves and those around us. 
um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some different roadway markings, in particular those um, related to walking and biking. Um, obviously, we've seen as, you, as we're moving around, there are some new and different um, markings and signs and things like that on our roads. And um, if those have appeared after we went through motor vehicle driver education, they may or may not be known to us. So we'll spend a little bit of time for that. Um, I will uh, aim to save time for questions at the end, but please do jump in during the presentation if, if I'm saying anything that um, you want some more clarification or information on. Um, the Bicycle Alliance I mentioned is um, a statewide nonprofit that does bicycle advocacy, encouragement, and education events. The mission, as you see, is to strengthen bicycle advocacy, provide education, work for a more bicycle-friendly Minnesota so that bicycling is easy, safe, and fun for everyone. Um, I mentioned some of our education work. Um, a lot of the education work that we do formally is through uh, statewide partners, including the Department of Transportation and the Department of Health. Um, the largest program we have is our school-based program, Walk, Bike, Fun. Um, but we also do provide education to um, adults, um, mostly through the Smart Cycling Curriculum, um, which is a program of the League of American Bicyclists, the national um, organization. Um, and I just want to mention that because we will be focusing mostly on people driving tonight, but I want folks to know that we are also in the business and actively educating people who are uh, walking and biking. Um, so who are we actually talking about, these people who walk and bike in Minnesota? Um, throw some statistics up here just to give us a sense of uh, what it means when we're talking about pedestrians and bicyclists in Minnesota. Um, in, this is from a statewide survey that MnDOT actually did a few years ago. And they found that in the greater Minnesota, outside of the Twin Cities Metro, one in five people are riding their bike at least one time a week. So it's not just a big city thing, it's um, statewide. And um, in the whole state, 38% are riding at least one time a month. So it's not, not quite a majority, but a whole lot of people are riding. Altogether, those people riding their bikes account for around 90 million trips annually in Minnesota. So it's, it's a lot of bicycling happening. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a high percentage of trips taken. Um, this, is, this data is specific to St. Paul, um, but uh, in, that, in that city in this time frame, um, almost a sixth of, of all trips were taken by walking or biking. So it's not just one type of person. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a few different rider profiles again, just to get us in the mindset of like who these people might be. So it might be people like Kelly. Um, Kelly lives in Rochester, she rides for work. Um, this uh, slide was taken from a presentation around bike basics and riding to work. So we don't need to see all the different things that Kelly's considering, but um, the, the message here being that different people will have different reasons for wanting to ride their bike, whether it's for transportation. There are other riders in the state like Sandy. Um, Sandy is an older woman who rides primarily for fitness reasons. Her physician recommended some physical activity and so Sandy has made a goal for herself of riding 40 to 50 miles every other day. Sandy is out there a whole lot um, out in greater Minnesota riding her bike for health reasons. Um, people also walk places. They walk to get places. They walk for um, utility. They walk for recreation. Um, ben lives in the Twin Cities. He walks his dog. Um, he walks for, for errands. Um, and so there's a lot of different types of people uh, moving around by walking and biking. Unfortunately, we know that people when they're walking and biking are actually at greater risk um, for being injured. And most of that be is because of conflicts with motor vehicle drivers. So our reason tonight um, for, for sharing this information is to help to reduce some of those risks so that folks can easily walk and bike um, for the ways in which they want to. And again, as a reminder, Everybody has a, a right to use those roadways and a responsibility for safety. So how do we, driving motor vehicles around, make sure that people walking and biking can um, get around safely? Uh, here are our top five habits of people-friendly drivers. And we'll be going into depth on each one of these a little bit. Uh, first and foremost, uh, by not driving aggressively or distracted or intoxicated. Um, those are all risk factors that put people outside of your vehicle and inside of it at greater risk. So by not doing these things, we can make the road safer. Um, driving the speed limit is a safe driver habit. Um, we know that speed is implicated in nearly every crash type that happens. Um, if we just slow down, we have more time to respond to things. We decrease 
um, our stopping distances and our impacts. Um, so just slowing down is a simple, easy way to make our road safer. Um, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about what, how we act out this third one, but being alert for bicyclists and pedestrians, um, especially at intersections and trail crossings, places they are likely to be crossing your path and being prepared to stop and yield as necessary. Um, and we'll again, go into a lot more detail about some specific kind of situations and how we can practice that. Um, fourthly, when we're passing a bicyclist in our motor vehicle, uh, it is important to be patient. Um, it's not always safe or possible to safely and legally pass. And so we and want to encourage drivers to slow down and make sure we're only passing when it's clear and safe to do so. Um, and again, we'll talk a bit more detail about exactly how that happens. And then lastly, um, this actually is a, a thing that motor vehicles drivers do, but not while they're uh, driving, but when they're entering or exiting their vehicles, opening those car doors. Um, the, about the third most common cause of injuries between cyc cyclists and motor vehicle drivers um, happens from car doors being opened into the path of a cyclist. And so an, an easy, safe thing that we can do to increase um, safety and decrease those, those uh, crashes is by looking into the travel lane before we open our car. Um, and we'll share kind of a tip around that um, in a little bit. So I'm gonna share here, um, again, some more detail or information on these kind of common mistakes that lead to crashes. The idea being that if we, when we understand where these risks occur, we can be more proactive in um, taking precautions to avoid making these mistakes. Um, this next slide here, I'm gonna throw up a whole lot of words real fast. I'm not gonna read through them. I'm not gonna ask you to, uh, but the point of this slide is mainly to understand that um, mistakes can happen no matter how we're moving about, whether we're driving a motor vehicle, whether we're walking or rolling um, or riding a bike. And the, the point here isn't to point fingers, um, to say that one group is responsible for everything bad that happens out there because we know that's not true. Um, rather, we want to understand that uh, we all have rights and responsibilities um, and there's things that each of us can do to be uh, as safe as possible. Um, usually when crashes happen, it's not only one single type of mistake. It's, it's usually the case that there's multiple uh, mistakes, often from both sides that are happening. So um, in the event of a crash, it's, it's often the case that both parties could have taken steps, could have done things differently to prevent that crash type from happening. Um, and again, our, our point isn't to assign blame here, but just to um, spend time understanding what we do. And again, tonight, um, although we know that pedestrians and bicyclists also um, can do things, we're going to be focusing on the role as motor vehicle drivers. We, I mentioned earlier about slowing down. Um, many of you have probably seen a graphic like this or similar to this, um, just showing the, how speed is implicated in um, injury and fatalities. Um, the, as the graphs get bigger here are showing the higher rates of injuries or fatalities. Um, and as you go from slower speeds to higher speeds, you can see that the, the injury rates get much greater. Um, and above 40 miles an hour, you're approaching 100%, where every crash that happens at those high speeds results in serious injury. Um, 30 miles an hour is what most of our uh, residential and um, city speed limits are posted at. But even reducing that speed down to like a 20 mile an hour has a huge impact on traffic safety. Um, and so anything we can do to encourage drivers to slow down uh, does dramatically increase the safety for everybody on the roadway. Um, I'm gonna next go through some of the common characteristics of bike crashes. And again, the point here is that we understand how and when crashes happen, we can be proactively avoiding them. Um, intersections are the most frequent location type for, um, for crashes with involving motor vehicles. And the reason for this is uh, simply that uh, intersections are complicated. There's a lot of different people there and there's a lot of different movements happening. Many, many things to try to pay attention to that's challenging. Um, and we're not always very good at recognizing every potential hazard or danger. Um, but this is important to note simply because when we come to an intersection, we wanna make sure we're um, paying extra attention and being extra alert here. So I'm gonna talk a, a bit more specifically about types of intersection crashes. Um, this here is uh, what we might call a failure to yield or a pull out where the motor vehicle driver on the right, um, who is governed by that stop sign in front of them, 
um, pulls out into traffic without recognizing that there's actually a person um, riding in that travel lane and potentially causing a crash. Um, I'm also, uh, several of these, I've got a video clip to share to kind of, um, to animate these. And I'll just uh, say too that from the video clips we're gonna watch, nobody was seriously injured um, in those video clips. But that's gonna come up right now. So here's an example of what this pullout mistake can look like. And that's actually a fairly frequent, this is um, not at an intersection per se, as you, as you notice here, whoops. Um, I exited my presentation, we'll go back into it. Um, let's see, I want to, oh, might start me over. Shoot. Oh, good. Right back to where I left off. Um, these, this crash type uh, is likely at intersections, but also driveways, um, alleys, other places where motor vehicle paths cross. Um, a, in this case, is a shared uh, mixed use trail um, or sidewalk. Those can be particularly dangerous. Um, I'll mention a little bit later about some of the risks of riding on the sidewalk, uh, but you can keep in mind this example when I mention that um, and why we discourage riders from riding on the sidewalk. Um, that's a place where crash types like this are especially common or likely um, because drivers just aren't paying attention to fast moving traffic approaching um, their vehicle from a sidewalk location. So as a people friendly driver in a situation like this, we want to make sure that we are looking for all traffic and yielding appropriately to driver or drivers who are already in the lane. Um, in this case, when I say drivers, I'm referring to the, the person who's driving their bicycle in the street. Another crash type that happens uh, often at intersections is known as a left cross type. Um, this is where an oncoming motor vehicle driver makes a left turn uh, across the path of somebody who's riding their bicycle. Um, in this graphic, the cyclist is riding in the street. This is another really common um, error type that happens uh, when riders are on a sidewalk because that's just not a place where drivers are expecting or looking for traffic to be crossing. Um, and that's particularly true when that sidewalk traffic is moving in the same direction. So in this case, if you imagine a cyclist riding down the sidewalk from the top of the screen, um, moving the same way, entering the intersection as that driver is turning left, um, that's a, a really dangerous situation. And again, um, a reason why riding on the sidewalk can be uh, more risky. Um, another short video clip to show this left cross. In this case, um, we're looking in the crosswalk uh, that's off screen to the left right now uh, for a pedestrian crossing through the crosswalk. Oh, sorry, it's straight in front of us. Um, somehow the driver turning left failed to see the person walking through the crosswalk. So don't let that be you. People friendly drivers check all traffic before turning across an oncoming lane. Um, both oncoming traffic as well as uh, sidewalk traffic or crosswalk traffic. Um, so drivers, when you approach an intersection, please don't try to pass a bicyclist. Don't try to speed past them and turn right in front of them. We're just going to wait. The graphics on here were actually taken from our commercial vehicle drivers training um, that we did, did a number of years ago. Um, we've been involved with training bus drivers as well as law enforcement people who drive for work. Um, so lots of different audiences for this information, but this is true for, for anybody driving a motor vehicle. Um, a, one name for that crash type is called a right hook. And in this case, you see that the vehicle driver, uh, the motor vehicle driver is passing on the left immediately before they're needing to turn right. So they're turning across the path of somebody. Um, we should, we should not be doing that. We should be yielding before turning right. This is true even in the case where there is a bike lane present. Um, so in this graphic here, the red arrow is shown what not to do, um, going all the way to the intersection and turning across the bike lane. Um, that is not allowed. Um, and so rather what we expect or ask, well, it is the, what the statute requires is that motor vehicle drivers yield, merge, 
uh, into the bike lane prior to the intersection and then turn through the bike lane. Um, this is something that um, we know has come up relatively recently as the bike lanes become more common um, and that this information has not been shared. We haven't educated our public as well as we could have and need to around this. So this is something that many people are not aware of. Um, it's one of the times when you're allowed to and actually required to drive your motor vehicle in a bike lane. Um, and this is, so our bike lanes are supposed to be um, dashed before intersections so that that solid line on the left side of the bike lane should become a dashed line as it approaches the intersection, indicating that it is uh, permissible to, to merge through that. Even if that line is painted solid, the way that it's depicted in this graphic, drivers are still supposed to and, um, and actually required to merge into that bike lane before turning at the intersection. Um, I'm just mentioning that because it's not a surprise to me that there is confusion around this. We haven't done a great job educating our drivers and even the infrastructure itself is sometimes um, counterintuitive or contradicting uh, what, what should be happening out there. So that's why it's important that we um, get this information out and, uh, with this program. Um, another picture of like what this might look like in practice, again, taken from the commercial vehicle drivers. In this case, we have a large, large truck, um, looks like a salt truck maybe approaching the intersection. Um, here the bike lane actually does go from solid to dashed as it's approaching the corner. Um, we want that vehicle not to turn all the way across the bike lane at the intersection, but rather to merge in and turn through the bike lane. That might be hard for this commercial vehicle driver with their long turning radius, um, but that's what we're wanting for drivers to do. It's the safest practice. Um, so our next uh, people-friendly habit here relates to the passing of bicyclists. Three feet is the minimum amount of space required to pass a bicyclist to the left of them. Um, in most cases, that's going to mean moving into the adjacent or oncoming lane um, uh, and waiting. So waiting until that space is clear and safe to make that pass. Um, most of our roadways, the vast majority of our roadways in Minnesota are too narrow for a motor vehicle driver to pass within a single lane um, of a person riding their bike and allowing for that three feet of road space. Um, and so that means that almost always in order to pass, we'll need to yield, move into the next lane um, and then pass when it's clear and safe to do so. That's even the case where there's double yellow lines. Um, this was a, a relatively new law change um, in the last few years that uh, motorists are allowed to cross a double yellow line for the purpose of passing a cyclist in the same direction. Um, in cases where, they, where this happens, um, the onus is on the motor vehicle driver to make sure that it's clear and safe to do so. so um, but the reason that this law was changed is because not only is this common practice, um, but it's actually almost always the safer practice as opposed to um, coming up on a cyclist unexpectedly and having to, uh, you know, hit the brakes suddenly to, to reduce your speed from what's often a, a high speed roadway down to the speed of a cyclist. Um, slowing down in most cases is, is its own risk. And so if it is clear and safe to pass, uh, that moving over for the, the couple seconds that it takes to move around that cyclist um, is, is often safer and allowed. See, there's a few chat things in here. I'm just gonna look and make sure I'm not missing any questions. It looks like I haven't, so. Um, sometimes at this point, drivers will want to know about why there's a person riding their bicycle in the general travel lane in the road. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of reasons that a bicyclist might be riding in the shoulder or gutter space. Um, I mentioned earlier already about how the sidewalk uh, is not actually a space that's meant for people to be riding their bikes in. Um, it's dangerous for other people walking on the sidewalk um, and it actually ends up being more dangerous for the person riding. So often the roadway is the safest place for a person to ride. Um, cyclists should not be riding in the shoulder or gutter space um, because that puts themselves at greater risk. Um, they should be riding in the rightmost lane that leads to their destination. So if it's a multi-lane roadway, they'll be in the rightmost lane, except when they're needing to pass a slower vehicle um, or a delivery driver or something, or if they're preparing to turn left, um, then they may not be in the rightmost lane. 
Um, so in all cases, we're expecting and asking that bicyclists are making their lane choice based on their safety and their destination. Um, so when, if you're driving and you see somebody biking on the street, we should make the same assumption. This must be the safest place that for this person to ride um, that gets them to where they're going. I, I promise you that nobody is out there biking in the street to be a jerk and to, to slow people down. Um, we're all just trying to get where we're going. So don't take my word for it. We've got another quick little video uh, animation um, and I can share this link to, well, maybe after we're done um, in the chat in case you feel inspired to share it with somebody else. Oh. Back. All right. Yeah, it's gonna go into a new window. Are you following me into a new window or is it? Okay, great, I see thumbs up on that. For just $67, you can make as many videos as you want. And watch a little bit never here. pick up a camera or use any fancy editing software. If you drag, Back driving in the middle of the road. Why don't they move over so I can pass them? Today, we're going to explain what's happening here in under 90 seconds. Ready? There are lots of road hazards that are worse for bikes than cars. Potholes, car doors opening, roadkill. Ew. For these reasons, it's usually safer for a bicyclist to use the middle of the lane. Plus, riding here makes the rider more visible to approaching traffic from behind and gives a better line of sight for vehicles entering the road. Are they allowed to be there, even if they're traveling slowly? Yes. Yes, they are. And if they're not going as fast as I want to drive, can't I squeeze past in the same lane? Great question! Definitely not. Just as you would pass a slow vehicle, you'll need to yield, change lanes to the opposite lane when safe, and then pass with a minimum of three feet of distance. And lastly, never, ever pass a bicyclist before turning right. Slow down, signal to your turn, and safely merge into the bike lane if there is one. This is the one time you're allowed to drive a car in the bike lane. Yield to bikes that are going straight. There you have it. Use these tips to protect your car from bike scratches. And maybe, you know, save someone's life while you're at it. Jump back over here, hopefully. So there you have it. You can protect your car from those annoying bike scratches. That's my least favorite part of that video. Um, okay. So just to kind of hammer home this point a little bit more, um, the screenshots here uh, on the left was taken um, seconds before a serious crash. Uh, in the right, we have transposed the bicyclists who are riding on the edge of the roadway. Um, they're positioned more towards the center of the roadway. And you can just, you can see between the two images, um, the one on the right, the positioning makes them a lot more noticeable. Um, like less likely to be overlooked by an inattentive motorist. So this was actually from um, a bus in California, which is why we have the dash cam of it. So um, unfortunately, those cyclists uh, did not avoid serious injury. Um, and not, not to say that uh, they couldn't have been injured if they had been in the roadway, but certainly their position uh, makes them a lot more conspicuous. So this is speaks to why people may choose to be riding closer to the middle of the road. Um, because even on that left photo, they're on the right edge of the road, they're less visible, but they're still even in that position, not sufficient space for a driver to pass them without moving into the adjacent lane. Um, so it, it may feel that uh, sometimes it would be the courteous thing to do to kind of squeeze over to the edge of the road, um, but that doesn't actually allow for the, the passing in any different way to happen. It just makes them less noticeable and puts them at greater risk. We saw a couple of references already to the door zone. Um, what we mean by the door zone is just a space close to a motor vehicle where um, the driver could open the car door into that path. And so there's another reason why bicycles may not be riding right near the right edge of the roadway. We've parked vehicles there. As motor vehicle drivers, how can we help to do this? Um, this next little uh, video clip describes 
is sometimes called the Dutch reach, um, but reaching across your body to open the vehicle door as opposed to reaching with the closest hand. Uh oh, try to launch that video. No, no sound in that video, but um, it was just, again, depicting the person reaching across their body. When you reach across your body, it kind of turns your shoulders, turns your head towards the rear of the vehicle um, and cues you to just look behind and make sure that there's not um, another vehicle or person um, in, the, in the path before your car door is open. Oops. Sorry, I hit the, the wrong thing here. Um, the next slide here when it comes up is going to just show us um, about blind spots and um, so this is showing again from a commercial vehicle or a large vehicle driver's position looking to their driver mirror looking out the passenger side um, not being able to see them there's your spotting mirrors so for people riding their bikes, we teach about the no zone um, to communicate the, the blind spots that large vehicles have. Um, and so the, the advice or guidance around this is when we're approaching an intersection, if there's a large vehicle there, um, we wanna, as bicyclists or pedestrians, wanna stay out of those blind spots, wait until that intersection, until that vehicle has cleared the intersection before proceeding. We have one more video to kind of depict these blind spots. It's short, 15 seconds as you see. Looking to the driver's side, nobody there. Somebody in front of the cab you couldn't see from inside. And then several people on the other side um, who are all invisible from, from looking from the cab. So. Okay, um, questions on anything of covered so far. I don't see anything in the chat or hands raised. So I'm just gonna keep on uh, going with the content here. Um, so the next section again talks about the, the markings and the laws related to those markings and signs um, at, that we should know. The first thing to note is that in the state of Minnesota, every single intersection, any place two roadways are meeting is considered a legal crosswalk for pedestrians, um, meaning that they have the right of way. And that's true whether there is um, signage there. That's true whether there are stripes there. Um, that's true with this curb cut of this pork chop um, in the median space. I'm sure this driver in the gray car is right about to stop and yield for our friend crossing the street. Um, even an intersection that looks like this, that has no markings of any kind, no crosswalks, um, is not even a curb cut on the right there, um, is considered a legal crosswalk. If you see a person um, attempting to cross the street there, all drivers are expected to yield for that pedestrian until they're um, all the way across your lane. So as we're approaching intersections, we want to again be scanning, looking for pedestrians who might be attempting to cross, um, and then waiting until they've crossed all the way across your lane of travel. Um, if they're crossing away from you at the intersection, as soon as they've crossed past your lane of travel, you are allowed to uh, continue. If they are crossing towards you um, and they're not yet to your lane of travel, you do not have the right to zip through that intersection quick before they get there. Um, if somebody's crossing towards you in a crosswalk, you need to yield and wait until they are all the way past your lane of travel. Um, so next we're gonna go into some bike signage. And here we have a whole bunch of different things. We've got some wayfaring signs. We've got a bikes may use full lane a couple different versions of share the road um, and some sharrows in here. And what the heck do they all really mean? Well, these ones all basically mean the same thing. Um, they mean be alert for bicycle traffic. They are not connoting any specific responsibility for drivers that would be different anywhere else. They are just advisory. They're letting people driving know that they are likely to or more likely to encounter bicyclists on these roadways. Um, so shared lane markings, may look a little bit different. You can drive over these 
Um, and again, they're advisory. They're just letting you know to expect the presence of people riding their bikes there. Um, the one on the left is sometimes called a Chero um, or a Chevron. The one on the right has the, the boulevard indication. And that's just, again, a preferred street for bicyclists. Usually those um, are marked on streets that are lower traffic volumes, lower speed roadways um, is, is when they put these types of markings down. Um, these are different from a bicycle lane. A uh, bicycle lane, like you see in the picture, and we'll go through some different um, examples of what those might look like, um, is exclusive use for bicyclists. People driving their motor vehicle drive, uh, motor vehicles um, can uh, enter or cross a bike lane only under a couple specific circumstances, those being entering or exiting a parking space, entering, exiting a driveway, or preparing to turn right at an intersection. Those are the the places where we're allowed to drive in the bike lanes. Otherwise, they are only for people um, traveling by bicycle. Um, and they can look kind of different. So some of them will have some bicycle markings in them. Sometimes we see them with paint applied. Um, and that's just to, the paint doesn't mean anything special. It's, it's to get people's attention. Um, but we should treat that like any other bike lane. Um, the advisory bike lane actually is an exception. These are not common at all. They're done on sort of a pilot basis. Um, basically, an advisory bike lane, um, this is the right graphic right now, uh, is a, a bike lane on a street that's not really wide enough to have a bike lane installed. A bike lane should be at least five feet wide. If that street doesn't have space for a bike lane in each direction, plus two lanes of motor vehicle traffic, um, that are supposed to be 12 feet wide each, they sometimes will put in these advisory bike lanes. In most cases, if they're um, is not another vehicle uh, oncoming in the roadway. People driving their vehicles should drive outside of the bike lanes. But if there is another oncoming vehicle and they need to um, use the bike lane space, they're allowed to do so. Um, they just need to yield to traffic that's in the bike lane already. So again, not very common. There's probably fewer than a half dozen in the state at this time. Um, the next one here shown is a buffered bike lane. In this case, there is a, a space that's demarcated with paint to allow um, some more separation from other modes of traffic. Um, and sometimes, though, that buffer can be a physical buffer, um, and we call that a protected bikeway. Uh, in this case, the one shown uses park vehicles um, to create that physical buffer. We sometimes see planters um, or concrete jersey barriers. Um, or other kinds of bollards, any physical separation um, makes that a protected bikeway. All of these though are exclusive use for, for bicyclists. So here's some real world examples. This one has a couple different um, of those uh, elements that I just described. Uh, further down the lane, you can see that paint applied to give a space separation um, at the intersection is treated with that green paint. That green paint doesn't mean any special responsibilities for anybody, it's just to get attention. Um, here's a protected bikeway. Uh, this one has both the paint space, but also the vertical elements, the plastic bollards there, to give a little bit more visibility and separation um, between the general travel lanes. So bike lanes are not for parking, even for short term, even just to drop something off, pick up your friend quick. Um, those are not, not acceptable reasons to be parking in a bike lane. Um, the problem with parking in a bike lane, and I know it seems really convenient, and then you're, you know, getting out of the way for other motor vehicle drivers. The problem is that for anybody who's trying to use that bike lane, you're forcing them to merge out into um, fast moving traffic. And so this is why it creates danger and, um, and, and why it's prohibited. Um, driving bike lanes. Not allowed, I mentioned the, the three cases for parking space or a driveway or turning right at the intersection, but otherwise um, drivers are expected to stay out of those bike lanes. Um, confusingly, even on streets where there is a bike lane present, you might see people riding their bikes outside of that bike lane, it might be for different reasons. Sometimes you can see in the picture, there are hazards or barriers or obstacles in the bike lane that make that not suitable space to ride. Um, or they might be turning left up ahead. Um, and similarly to how we teach drivers not to turn across a lane of traffic to turn right, um, we teach bicyclists not to turn across a lane of traffic to turn left. And so they might be um, out of the bike lane preparing to turn left. Um, 
in the picture on the right here, I see that there's somebody stopped in the bike lane up ahead. Um, maybe they uh, had a flat tire or something and the person is moving out of the bike lane to go around that slower um, user. So again, this uh, presentation is primarily focused on the rights and responsibilities of motor vehicle drivers, but um, because we often get asked, well, what about cyclists? What about pedestrians? Don't they know they have to follow the law too? Yes, they do. Um, here's what's expected of those folks. Um, so when you are when you are walking as a pedestrian, um, you're expected to look before you cross, to make yourself visible to drivers, um, avoiding just dangerous and distracted behaviors. Those are not actually required, but they certainly are recommended. So um, pedestrians cannot be ticketed for texting while walking. Um, that's not something that we prohibit, um, but we know that it's something that can put them at greater risk. And so we discourage people, particularly when you're crossing motor vehicle traffic, um, from doing these distracting behaviors. Um, bicyclists are expected to follow the rules of the road, including um, when they're riding their bikes in the street, obeying all laws that apply to all motor vehicle drivers. Um, bicyclists should be predictable, both through the use of their positioning as well as using hand signals when it's safe for them to do so. Um, being conspicuous by using reflectors and lights is required to do so. Um, and then more so for their convenience, but thinking ahead uh, means kind of driving defensively and riding ready, being prepared for whether it's weather or mechanical um, breakdowns, um, having, having a plan to, to make sure they can get where they're going safely. Um, I mentioned hand signals. Here's sort of a review of hand signals. The one on the far left um, is what we call the old right turn signal with their left arm um, upward. That signal is still allowed and can be used, but we know that it's not reliably used. People don't often always remember um, how to use that correctly. And probably more importantly, people driving vehicles may not understand what is um, trying to be communicated by using that. So the preferred right turn signal is the one next to it where the person um, riding their bike is using their right arm straight up to the side to point where they're turning. Um, when we do bike education, that's what we tell cyclists to just point where you turn um, when it's safe to do so. Um, and the note on the bottom here is that if the person riding their bike needs to both hands on the handlebars to be in control, then that should be their priority. And so they may not be using their hand signals uh, prior to turning. Um, when, it's, when it's possible and safe, it's, it does make it easier and safer to let folks around them know what's happening, but it's not always possible. Can people riding on the street ride next to each other? They can. Um, unless they are restricting the normal and reasonable flow of traffic. Um, to me, as I understand that, that means that if it were possible for a motor vehicle driver to pass within the same lane without yielding and moving around them, um, then they should be riding single file. Um, that, that ends up being a lane space that's about 17 feet wide. That's not a very common configuration. Um, our average or our standard lane within Minnesota is only 12 feet wide, which is much too narrow to share side by side. So on almost all roadways, um, riding two abreast is allowed and it's actually can be a lot safer. Um, that's particularly true when we're riding in a group. Um, riding uh, with riders abreast or next to each other um, reduces the amount of uh, road space that they're taking up. Um, so it decreases the amount of passing space uh, compared to if they were riding all single file, they would be you know spread out twice as long on the road, you'd have to, it would take twice as long for a motor vehicle driver to, to move into the next lane for passing. Um, so yes, it's allowed in almost all instances. And in fact, it ends up being safer for everybody involved. Um, do they have to have lights and reflectors? They do. Um, when it's dark, bicyclists are required to have a white forward facing headlight, in the back, a red reflector or a tail light, and we're um, in the practice of telling people that anything you can do to make yourself more visible is in your interest. So we're encouraging people to um, use as much reflective equipment and lights as they can. Um, and here's our, our note on sidewalk riding. So um, sidewalks can be an okay place to ride, um, particularly for younger, smaller, newer riders that are going slower speeds, um, that are being supervised by a responsible adult. Um, sidewalks can be great places to ride. Um, if the sidewalks don't have a lot of conflict points, they don't have driveways or alleys um, or intersections, 
um, then they can they can even be safe places to ride. Um, but there are other hazards of sidewalk riding. One is other users. So people walk, sidewalks are meant for walking. People using them should be traveling at a pedestrian speed. Um, people on foot can change direction suddenly. They can stop, they can, um, you know, <laughs> do what pedestrians do. They might notice a flower that they're suddenly interested in and, and change paths unexpectedly. And that's fine. Um, they're, people are allowed to be people. Uh, but we want to understand that that's what sidewalks are for. And if, if people are riding on the sidewalks, um, understand that they need to be doing things differently. A person riding their bike on the sidewalk is required to yield to all other users on the sidewalk and give an audible warning before passing, whether that's with their voice or using a bell or a horn or something to, to indicate their presence. Um, and then they still don't have the right to like zoom past somebody just because they tooted their horn. Uh, they still need to wait, um, but they're expected to, to let somebody know that they're there. Um, and generally, I mentioned earlier, but generally for experienced or adult riders, we discourage riding on the sidewalk um, because when you're traveling at faster speeds, it creates uh, added dangers, both for other users as well as for the person riding. Um, it puts them in greater conflict with motor vehicle drivers because of all the places sidewalks cross the path of uh, motorized traffic. So we're back to our, uh, our top five habits here. Just to reiterate, um, as a people-friendly driver, we want to avoid distraction. We want to slow down, be alert, prepared to stop or yield, be patient, and look. If you feel so inclined, um, you can join me in saying this pledge. Um, about being a people-friendly driver, and I can't see all of your video monitors, so I won't know. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the pledge, but I'm going to say, I pledge to be a role model of safe driving anytime I am driving, to use our streets with caution, awareness, and in such a way that respects the lives and dignity of pedestrians, bicyclists, and other motorists, and to share my knowledge with friends, coworkers, and family. Um, if you are, feel so inclined, uh, it invites you to participate in a quiz. Um, the quiz really is for helping the Bicycle Alliance to establish this program to document that, um, that it is effective, that people do learn things when they take this, um, so that we can ultimately um, take this from a pilot program to something that's funded and make sure that we can share this information really widely with every motor vehicle driver in the state, not just those who uh, volunteer to, to spend an hour of a beautiful May afternoon um, listening to me talk. But I do really appreciate you all being here and taking the time to hear this presentation today. Um, I see that we finished just a little bit early. Uh, I did want to save some time for the quiz in case anybody wanted to do that. Um, it takes maybe five to 10 minutes to complete. Um, and I'm going to leave up. Well, I'll come back to this just so we can see the URL. But I just want to quickly say thank you. And I'll stick around here if there are any other questions that folks have or want to chat a little bit more. I see Gabby has shared the link in the, the chat. So thank you for doing that, Gabby. Otherwise, if there are not questions, uh, I invite you all to, to go outside and enjoy some beautiful sun. But looks like Andrea yeah. had a question. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm curious about your take on, um infrastructure so that that could be safer for bicyclists easier for drivers to see pedestrians and bicyclists what is what is your take on roundabouts we're seeing more of those uh, proposed for our area mm -hmm. and um there's always some initial pushback yeah on those and i'm curious from a perspective of uh bikes and peds yeah, I think with all new infrastructure, um, one of the things that's really important is just education and making sure people understand um, how to use it correctly. Um, one of the great things about roundabouts is that um, even if you're not sure how to use it correctly, it does make things safer. And the reason I say that is that anytime people feel uncertain, they tend to kind of slow down and pay more attention. Um, and so something like a roundabout that is unexpected or unfamiliar just naturally creates that response in folks. Um, on the other hand, 
when there is uncertainty about what somebody should do at an intersection, that can uh, have the opposite effect. Um, so that's why I say that the education is really important on that. Generally speaking, the reason that we see so many roundabouts is because there's really solid data to support that they are safer for all road users. Um, they decrease speeds, they, uh, they decrease the type of um, like uh, perpendicular impacts. So when, when uh, crash types do happen, they tend to be kind of uh, the side swipe variety. Um, so we, we don't have those um, perpendicular crashes happening. The design speed for most roundabouts is around 17 miles an hour. So it just it forces drivers to slow down. That is by design and by intention. Um, for people crossing at the roundabouts, uh, as opposed to other intersections where you might have 12 different movements happening with the through traffic and the turning traffic, um, you really only have a couple things to pay attention to. And so there's less happening there. So there's less distractions. There's less other things for drivers to be paying attention to. Um, the crosswalks are frequently placed before drivers are entering the actual roundabout. So you're paying attention. You see the pedestrian, you should yield to them before you even had to start negotiating the roundabout. Um, so they can be safer for that reason. For people riding their bikes, they're either gonna be um, traveling through in the, the motor vehicle lane. Um, bicyclists can actually move through roundabouts in some cases faster than motor vehicle drivers, just the way that bikes turn and things. Um, and you know the way that they can uh, their, their path can be a little bit more direct um, compared to a motor vehicle driver who has to kind of, uh, you know, because they can move from the one side of the lane across the lane to the other's place and kind of have almost a straight shot through there. Um, and that 17 miles an hour is really conducive to, uh, to bicycle speed. Um, so for bicyclists moving in the travel lane, um, it's, it's really easy and convenient. For um, bicyclists who are choosing to navigate as pedestrians, they have the same advantages where they're crossing ahead of the intersection and getting a little bit extra visibility. So um, that's, that's the reason they're being used so frequently is because they've got this really well-established in increased safety effect. Um, and what's important to go along with that is just the driver education. Um, and for that matter, uh, any user education, pedestrians and bicyclists too can, can learn about how to use those appropriately. I should think about adding the roundabouts here to the, the presentation. I think that would be useful information to include. I see Jim's comment here as a driving instructor. Um, it says right on track. So I appreciate that. That's I'd be uh, embarrassed if I were saying things that were not uh, consistent with driver's education. So. Thanks for the endorsement, Jim. CJ, it's Jim. Um, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, yeah, I um, was working. I'm working somewhat with the uh, with the uh, safe safe paths to school person up here. So she told me about this tonight and said, "Hey, go on and watch it because I'm interested in in all that." Part of it is making sure I'm teaching what I should be teaching, which. It was really good to hear what you said. And I love the stuff about the roundabouts you just said too, because I'm out there on my bike. I'm out there driving. I'm out there driving kids who have no idea how to drive. Um, and, you know, they're in that process. We're doing roundabouts. We're, you know, it's coming into summer. We're watching the kids on the bikes. And, you know, the other piece to it is it just, it's not just happening in the summer anymore either, because we're, we're seeing bicyclists in the middle of winter doing stuff now more more than we have in the past, you know, that type of stuff with, you know, the, the fat tire bikes and all that fun stuff. Um, so it's really good to see that what you're doing out there with this stuff, because it's really awesome. So uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. Where are you, Tim, where are you joining us from today? Uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, this is good. I like it. Cool. Keep it up, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to join us tonight. Oh, not a problem. Um, CJ, you, you mentioned something about shared and mis mixed use trails early in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And if I recall, you noted something about how they sometimes can be potentially more dangerous to those using it because of how vehicles, and maybe I'm Putting, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I'll just, my question is, what's the take on 
shared mixed use trails versus bike lanes separate from sidewalks uh, versus like super sidewalks. We have some projects that are being proposed in the Duluth area and they're looking at kind of all these options. And I'm, I'm just curious what, what you think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that uh, makes my job a little bit easy is I get to always just say like, it depends. There's never any one single right answer. There's never, it's never a black and white sort of thing. This infrastructure is always good. This is always bad. Um, I think what I was meaning to say with that, and I was watching one of the, um, the pullout uh, crash type is that um, it, and it just depends on the, the conflict points and um, if that increases or decreases the amount of conflict points. So it, it totally depends on how they're installed. Um, there's, there's many places where the off street trails uh, reduce the number of um, interactions or conflict points between modes of travel. Uh, those, those types of infrastructure, those trails um, certainly make things safer um, relative to motor vehicles and bikes and pedestrians. Um, in other cases, we have um, shared use trails right alongside, like there's driveways and there's alleys and they're crossing crosswalks. Um, those have the same risks as sidewalks do. Um, they really end up being kind of a glorified sidewalk, just a wider sidewalk. Um, and the, the trouble with that is that motor vehicle drivers are not expecting fast traffic in particular to be crossing their path from a sidewalk. They will be looking for pedestrians, but after they've scanned right to left, they've seen that there's nobody moving pedestrian speed from their right and left, then they'll proceed through. Um, and if there is somebody approaching from a bicycle that they haven't seen, um, you know, they might not have seen them when they scan to the left, they look to the other side, they didn't see that person approach when they started to pull forward. And that's, that's kind of how that, that dynamic works. Um, so it, again, it just totally depends on how they're installed. Um, if they're installed in a way that minimizes those conflict points, then we're all for them. Um, and if they're put into places where there are, are frequent conflict points, then I would just recommend people treat them like a sidewalk and, and take appropriate precautions. One of the things that we try to do too when we're educating people on walking and biking is to understand that being on a sidewalk doesn't um, make you immune from these risks and dangers. And, and that in some cases can actually increase your exposure to risk. And so just understanding that, because um, I mentioned too how when a crash happens, it's frequently, you know, both sides have done something that they, um, that could be considered a mistake that could have avoided that crash. Um, and so, you know, in, in the case where a crash happens on the sidewalk, you know, the, the motor vehicle driver um, failed to yield, but the person uh, traveling on the sidewalk also was going too fast and also didn't yield. Um, a person riding their bike on the sidewalk or a shared trail that's crossing that um, should yield to crossing traffic at those places too. So that means, you know, if you're riding down a sidewalk and there's frequent driveways, each one of those driveway crossings is a place where you're expected to yield. And if somebody is coming in or out of that, um, the person on the sidewalk should be yielding too. Um, and so it's just, but it's just all about like the number of conflict points. The, the fewer there are, the safer it's going to be. Um, and if there's a frequent ones, then that place may not be an optimal place for riding. It was a long answer to a short question. You know, I get, it's Jim again, I get a lot of students that when I'm out driving with them and we come up to make a right hand turn and, and we tell them, you know, we're going to, we're going to move the car to the edge of the road to make that right hand turn because legally we can do that. We're supposed to do that. So bringing up the point about, yes, by law, we're supposed to cross the bike lane to get to the edge of the road to help make those right-hand turns. I have so many students that, you know, well, mom and dad say that I'm not supposed to cross that bike lane, that I can't do that. It's like, no, the reality of it is you're supposed to do that. But you also have to remember, if there's a bicyclist there, you need to yield the right of way to the, to the person on the bike. Yeah. You know, um, we had a case... Uh, I was talking with a parent one day, and this is not the same thing, but, you know, you mentioned, CJ, that, yeah, that part of the responsibility of bicyclists, as well as motorists and pedestrians, is we all have to follow the law. We all have to follow the rules of the road, so to speak. And, you know, I had a parent tell me that she came up to this intersection where she did not have a stop sign. So she, by law, has the right of way. And this kid came down the other the side street and literally blew through a stop sign. 
So she stopped, you know, the, the, the parents stopped, but the kid on the bike literally yelled at her that, hey, you need to stop for me. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, I get it. But no, that's not how that rule works there. You know, so it's really kind of a, it's just a tough one sometimes with, with, with the kids and the bikes. And I mean, it's not just kids, uh, adults, we see them just roll through stop signs all the time. I, okay, I'll admit it, I've done it too on my bike. But at least as I approach it, I'm checking to make sure it's clear before I do. And some, they're just going through it. And, and I'm not pointing fingers at that. I'm just saying, you know, that's part of the reality of, of all of us being out there sharing the road. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just, it's one of those issues that we all need to use our eyes and be aware of. And, you know, our big thing is we drive, we need to drive with our eyes. We need to ride our bikes with our eyes and see what's going on. And, and that's, our, that's our biggest asset when we're out there on the road is how well we use our eyes because that's how we can make good choices when we're out there based on what we see going on. That's how we make choices all the time based on the information we have. And we, get, we gather the information out there as, as motorists anyways and as bicyclists by using our eyes. The, uh, the pulling out of a driveway incident we saw that happen in the winter up here, uh, elderly gentleman on his bike, uh, and I caught it on videotape, um, a car, he was, he was riding down the sidewalk and a car pulled out of the parking lot of one of the restaurants and he had to slam on, the, the guy on the bike had to, had to hit the brakes, slam on the brakes just to keep from hitting the side of that car. And I don't think, I don't think the car driver had any idea that he was there. You know, um, not expecting a bike in the middle of winter, for one thing. Um, so, yes, that kind of stuff happens. I also saw somebody in a smart car. I'm going to pick on the smart car. I'm sorry. Did you know a smart car will fully fit in a bike lane? Mm. Yeah, there is. That's a little scary. So I saw her pull into this bike lane. And I'm thinking, okay, she's going to make a turn at that next corner. So, Good. No, she kept driving straight in the bike lane like it, like it was her driving lane for another two blocks. It's like, huh. We all make errors out there, but um, you know, we, we need to we need to be educating better, like you're saying, or or maybe not educating better, but making sure it's getting out there farther yeah. uh, so that more people are understanding this stuff. So yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And drivers don't understand roundabouts half the time either. How many times have you seen a driver enter a roundabout without even looking at the traffic that's already in there? You know, they just go in. But that's why we teach them how to be safe drivers. Lots of room for improvement. But like you said, that's why we teach them. That's why we're here. Yeah. And you're right. The roundabouts, they are safer. Uh, the types of crashes that happen in them. The, the conflict point issue, I share that with my driver's training class. And to be honest, they don't get it. You know, when I sit there and say, there's 32 spots in a standard intersection where a car can hit another car and another 16 in just a standard one lane intersection where a pedestrian can get hit by a car based on the path of travel of the car or where the pedestrian is, you know, so... Um, Someday I hope they look at that and go, oh, that's what Jim meant by that. Not after they hit somebody, you know, kind of before that would be really nice. So, yeah, so I'm glad you guys brought all that stuff up. That was awesome. So, enough from me. This made me think, um, did I, you probably know this, CJ, is there legislation proposed or past about allowing bicyclists to ride through stop signs if there's no traffic at other points in that intersection i feel like i saw something like that i'm curious if you North know Dakota passed it last year um, it's now the law in 12 states um, that that legislation is sometimes known as stop as yield or the idaho stop um, basically, the, um, the effect of that is to downgrade traffic control devices so that uh, for bicyclists, a stop sign becomes a yield sign where they have the obligation to yield to other traffic when they approach an intersection. But if it's clear, they can proceed through without completing a full stop. 
um, at red lights, those effectively get downgraded to a stop sign, where a bicyclist can make a full stop. If it's clear and safe to proceed, they can go straight through it. Um, Minnesota does not have that. It has been proposed here. It's not um, up for consideration this session. Um, so it's, that is someday that it's likely that that will eventually get adopted. Um, we, it's now been, um, the first place to do it was Boise, Idaho, which is why it's called the Idaho law. And there's now decades of data around that that shows that it's, it's not any less safe. And most of the data points to it actually having some minor safety in, increase um, in places where they do have adopted that, that legislation. So I think that there's, there's enough good reasons and evidence to, that it eventually will become um, part of our law here, but it's not at this time. Are there um, any other questions out there? Well, I just wanna say um, thank you, CJ, for taking the time. Um, this is a really, really great presentation. Um, and I'll be sure, so I'll, this, this session was recorded. Um, so I can send it out to all the participants for review, anybody that registered that wasn't able to make it along with this, um, Survey Monkey link as well. Um, I'll be sending that out. Um, but really, just thank you so much for your time and um, being part of Bus Bike Bus Bike Walk Month. Happy to do it. Thanks again.